Sanica. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to get my screen sharing going here. And hopefully that looks good for everybody. Uh, so pretext tagline is write once, read anywhere. And you can think of pretext in a lot of different ways. It's uh, different than what we've seen in the other presentations in that it's about authoring and publishing an entire book, a textbook, typically. Uh, it's certainly designed to create OER, and it was designed originally for math. We can certainly do everything in STEM. We can do all kinds of other disciplines as well. I like to think of it as an abstract specification of what a scholarly document looks like. That's a kind of a narrow version. I think most people think of it as the collection of conversions that we have from an, the authoring language to different output formats. And I'm gonna show you examples of those. If you're familiar with LaTeX, you could think of it as a modern replacement for LaTeX. We're very committed to creating accessible materials. Something we've discovered that maybe we didn't start out in the beginning is this idea that we have instructors and authors and publishers in OER, we're often all, all three of those roles are the same person, but uh, we have all three sort of groups and uh, we recognize that there's some interactions between those different groups that are important to think about. We have a set of 11 principles. I'm gonna show you a few of them along the way. Uh, the one that would be relevant here is this idea of publishers, scholars, instructors, students, and readers all interacting with one another in the course of the lifetime of a document. The big idea is that when you author in pretext, you're thinking about the structure of your document and it's captured as you write. And that's a hard transition for, for authors in the beginning. Uh, you're not able to influence presentation as part of the authoring. We've split that out as the publisher's role. It's the publisher that decides how to present your content. So that really is principle number one for us. What we get from that, we get a lot of things from that, but what we get that sort of first obvious thing is that we can create lots of different versions of a document in terms of the output. So we make two PDFs. One is what you might use for print on demand. Another is something that a reader might look at on a laptop or a desktop computer. Uh, HTML is probably the most powerful, the most interactive. Uh, it's incredibly accessible. I'll show you an example of that. We've gotten pretty good now at making EPUB and using that as a precursor for Kindle. That's uh, really matured over the summer. If you're into data science, Python, you know about Jupyter Notebooks, we can convert a textbook to a sequence of Jupyter Notebooks. We've developed a partnership recently with RuneStone, which I'll just uh, call a hosting service. And we're able to turn our HTML into a version that's fine tuned for RuneStone. We're able to make Braille. So you've seen the Braille coming out of MathJax in David's presentation. We're able to take that Braille and then what I call literary text and turn that into Braille and put all those pieces together and convert an entire textbook in an automated way to Braille with the accurate mathematics and without the need of paying a, a transcriber or taking the time for that. We make slideshows. I think Alex's slides were made in pretext and the one you're viewing now is as well. So that's our third principle. Here's what PDF looks like. I'm gonna keep showing you sort of the same section from Tom Judson's abstract algebra textbook. So we're gonna see this repeatedly, uh, a section on dihedral groups. And this would look familiar to anybody that has used the tech to write some materials. Uh, notice there's a diagram here with the n-gon and theorem 5.21. I'm gonna show you that in a couple of different forms. So that is uh, about the presentation of the dihedral group. But look closely at those three equations that are aligned there, because we're going to look at those again. This is what EPUB looks like. Uh, I'm using a, a desktop reader for Linux called uh, Foliate that I kind of like, but it would look the same or similar in Calibre or iBooks or something like that. So again, same material, same diagram same mathematics. 
and you know if you're if you're kind of a generalist in all of this i think something we've discovered is that uh, pdfs really are not a great format i mean everybody uses them but in stem they're not accessible uh why we're sort of captive to page numbers and margins and headers and footers and all that kind of stuff when people are reading electronically. EPUB is better, not a whole lot better. There's, it's not as good as HTML, but I would encourage anybody to think about EPUB over PDFs. Again, HTML is what everybody likes. Uh, this, I kind of like this is a different textbook. This is Active Calculus uh, out of Grand Valley State University. And we do really well on a phone. So David Farmer is uh, in attendance today. He's written a lot of the CSS and JavaScript that makes that possible. Alex has been involved in that as well. So uh, really good performance on small screens. So let me switch a tab here and hopefully that looks okay. Uh, this is Tom Judson's abstract algebra book. And this is what you would find when you first went to it online. Table of contents is interactive. You can use that sidebar or you can use this list here. I'm gonna look at chapter five on permutation groups. First thing you'll notice is some good looking math there. That all comes from MathJax. So MathJax is really what I like to call the enabling technology for pretext. That's what really got us started. Everything you saw in David's presentation with the, with the Braille and the exploring, all of that stuff was coming through this menu here. So every piece of mathematics you're gonna see here in this book has that menu and you can do all the accessibility stuff behind the scenes, our spoken word versions, all of that. So I've been showing you 5.2, which is the dihedral groups. There's that same image, and there's the same theorem 5.21 down there. I'm going to, I'm using my keyboard. I'm just going to zoom in a little bit, and you'll see that's kind of the first technical thing you might notice is that everything is scaling nicely. So the text, the math, and that image are all moving together with one another. I'm gonna go, usually I would resize my browser, but I'm not sure how that's gonna work uh, doing the screen sharing. I'm gonna keep zooming in. And the idea is that the uh, CSS and the JavaScript, I think here it comes on the next one. So I've, I've zoomed in far enough and this is what it looks like on a phone. Of course, the aspect ratio is not quite the same, but the first thing you notice is that the menu went away on the left and now your navigation buttons are down here and you can get some, uh, you can bring that side menu back if you really need it. So there's an entirely different interface when the screen width gets small enough. So I'll go back to normal. We have these things called knolls, K-N-O-W-L, and you, you'll see them in web work, you'll see them other places, and this is another thing that David Farmer has been promoting and working on. The proof, you may not wanna read that proof the first time you come here. You may not wanna read the proof during an exam or preparing for an exam. You might wanna read it at some point when you study this section. You just click on proof and the content of the proof is revealed in that gray box that I hope you can see. And when you're done with it, you can put it back away in its box. So that's a nice feature. Uh, we do all kinds of things. I'm gonna show you the, well, let me show you one other thing here. I'm gonna reload just so it's like I just brought up this page. If I'm using a screen reader, I'm gonna hit the tab key repeatedly to find my way around. And you can't see me hit it, but I'm hitting the tab key Normally, that would tab through all of those chapters and sections on the left-hand side, and somebody using a screen reader would have to tab about 100 times to get to the content. There's this little device, if you see a red box in the upper left there, that says skip to main content. And that's a, a standard thing that's buried within this page. And I'm going to hit enter, and that pink flash is telling the sighted reader that we've gone to 5.2 there. That's where, where the focus has gone. And now you won't see it quite as well, but if I tab, like you can see that chapter three link 
lit up there. And, and now I'm working through the content. So that's a device for people who use screen readers that a sighted reader would never know was there most likely. Uh, index, we don't have page numbers. So we don't say that the, let's see, algorithm division. So the division algorithm is not on page 93. It's a theorem and you can click on the theorem and there's a reminder of what the division algorithm is all about. And you could open the proof if you wanted to. If you really want to go learn more about the division algorithm, you can hit this in context link, which now you're going to behave sort of like a traditional hyperlink and you're going to go back someplace. And again, it's going to light up there. So you have an idea of where you landed. And now you could say, look at the example right after that. So lots of interactivity, engaging. Uh, there's, there's many more things I could show you, but I think that's a good sample of what the HTML looks like. We're able to embed lots of interactive assessments. So here's a static version. This is probably a few months old, but Alex has done a whole lot more work on the embedding of web work. Um, one of the things I wanna emphasize is that you can author a web work problem within pretext using pretext syntax for most of the text. And then we have a few extra elements that will get you some of the features of, uh, you know, randomizing a problem, those sorts of things. So your web work problems that you might author to go with a textbook can live inside the textbook. We have really preliminary stuff for my open math kind of proof of concept, but a, a my open math server can produce some pretext versions of its problems. And that's really, that's not production. That's something we should look at some more. Uh, I've said a little bit about Braille already. I think I'll go straight to an example of that. Uh, so this is that theorem that we were looking at in, uh, in the abstract algebra book. I've reproduced the theorem itself down below. The Braille there, uh, so Braille is not simply a mapping of the alphabet to cells. It is really a quite complicated uh, markup language, not, not substantially different than LaTeX. So some of the first things that you might see are there's a comma there, it's like a shift character right below the line of sevens. And then there's an exclamation point. The exclamation point is a cell that is shorthand for T-H-E. So that comma exclamation point is a capital T and then H-E. So that's the beginning of theorem. And then there's the number, the four is a period. This, uh, see if highlight works okay. Yeah, this underscore percent and underscore one. Those are delimiters that say, okay, we're not doing regular old Braille like it's a novel. We're doing specialized Braille for math and that's called Nemeth. So this little piece right here is the shift D and then the semicolon N. That's, I can't highlight it down below, but that's where it says the group D sub N. That's what you're looking at. Couple of subtleties. There's a reference to R and S, since those are single letter, single letters from the Latin alphabet as math variables. They do not get a nemeth begin and end. They are done in what is understood as italics. So that dot two per uh, semicolon there is do italics on the R. So we're making those kind of adjustments. But the thing I want to really show you is these equal signs are aligned. The equal sign is the dot K that you see here. And those first two equations, it might just kind of look accidental that they're aligned because their left-hand sides have the same number of cells. But the SRS is a cell short and it's still aligning the equal sign. So Volker Sorga, who works with the MathJax project, he's, that search rule engine is his deal. He's got these 2D layouts working now. So we're making good progress on Braille. That's a Jupyter notebook, same material. Uh, you will see some things that aren't quite so pretty in there. That needs, that conversion needs more work. I think I've mentioned a lot of these accessibility ideas. You know, there are things we can do like skip to main content. We can't write alt text for people's images. 
but we can make it as easy as we can for an author when they add an image to provide, we use a description element to provide a, a textual version of an image, a description that can migrate to the alt text. Uh, I packed in some various things here that just kind of didn't fit places. Uh, there's, there's a lot to describe. I've talked about web work. You can easily stuff a YouTube, a Vimeo, or if you've got your own MP4, or Gorbis, uh, you know, different, different versions of videos locally or hosted. You can embed those really easy. Desmos and GeoGebra, we have support for embedding those easily. You've seen the index. We have other conversions that are interesting, like building an entire solution manual for your book. Literate programming, if you know what that is. The words that you see like theorem and corollary and proof, those are, are localized. So we have 14 different languages. Uh, the latest one was Finnish. We have some uh, ones you might not think of like Afrikaans. Pretty active project, uh, you know, everything is open source. Uh, we've had 39 different contributors and there's 167 forks. So I'll do this really quick, but I just, I tried to list some of our books that I think you could put together almost an entire undergraduate curriculum using pre-textbooks. So there's three, you know, full three or four semester calculus projects there. Three, everybody loves linear algebra, apparently, myself included. There's three linear algebra books. And then we've got a, a pretty wide selection of upper division material. And, you know, I limited myself in some places to two or three of things. We've, this is not a comprehensive list. You can look at the catalog. So there's another one of our principles, you know, open source, no cost use it to, to build great material. That's what we were, that's the original motivation. Some links and uh, we've got a variety of supporters, both uh, people who contribute ideas and code and financial support from various organizations. Thank you.